The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's webinar. The title of our webinar is COVID Scams and Pandemic Financial Protection. And I'll introduce our excellent speakers shortly. Next slide. A quick dis disclaimer before we get started, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and the APS TARC are project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractors and our speakers' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent those of the Administration for Community Living. Official policy. Next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC, if you're not familiar with us, we are here to help adult protective services programs in any way that we possibly can. Just reach out to us. There'll be some contact information displayed at the end of the webinar. You can also find us by Googling APS TARC, T-A-R-C. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Uh, next slide. A quick plug for our peer-to-peer -peer calls. Please consider joining one of them. Um, if you're an adult protective services professional, we have three calls per month. We have one for investigators, one for supervisors, and then one for administrators as well. The schedule for these calls is on your screen. It's also on our website, though, if you want to check them out. And they're a great opportunity for um, APS staff to talk to each other about issues they're having in their area and to kind of problem solve and, and get some advice from each other. So um, if you work in APS, please feel free to sign up for one. Next slide. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today's slides are available to download in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on the icon that looks like a little piece of paper and you can download those slides. All participants are muted for the duration of this webinar, and you can either use your computer or telephone to access the audio. Please adjust the volume of your computer speakers to whatever level you desire. Um, if you have any problems with the audio or viewing the presentation, the best suggestion we have for you is to log out um, or close the webinar and then come back in, uh, re-enter. We find that that often fixes the issues if you're having connection problems. Next slide. If you have any questions of our presenters, you can simply type them in the questions box at any time. We'll take questions at the end of this webinar and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. But you don't need to pause um, to ask your questions uh, until the end. You can type them in at any point and we'll get to them when it's, when it's time to take questions. This session is being recorded. It will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify um, everyone who's registered when it's posted online. And then you'll receive an automatically generated email within about an hour or so um, after the webinar concludes that will include a link to a certificate of attendance if you would like to have that. It will also have a link to an evaluation survey, quick five question survey. If you could complete that for us, we would greatly appreciate it. So next slide. So now I want to do a quick poll just to get a feel for everybody who's in our audience today. And I'm going to launch that poll right now. You can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Uh, the question is, which of the following do you identify the most with? Do you consider yourself an adult protective services professional, an other social services professional outside of APS, um, a medical professional, a legal professional, or other if you don't fit into any of those categories? We will leave this poll open for another 20 seconds or so just to give people a chance to vote. And again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're having problems voting, it may be because you're in full screen mode, you might have to exit full screen before you can um, click on one of the answers and vote. All right, so I'm gonna close that poll out in just a few seconds. Close that out now and share the results with everybody. It looks like 65% of you work in APS in some capacity. 19% consider yourselves other social service professional, 1% medical, 4% legal, and 11% other. So thank you for taking that poll with us. We greatly appreciate it. So um, next slide. And I would like to introduce today's speakers. Lisa Weintraub Schifferly is a senior policy analyst with the Office for Older Americans at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. 
I'm Bridget Small is a consumer education specialist at the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. I think we're very fortunate to have both of these speakers to share their wealth of knowledge about scams and fraud related to the pandemic. So I will turn things over to Lisa to get us started. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Schifferly, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. I'm here with Bridget Small, and I'll be kicking things off and telling you a bit about COVID scams, and then Bridget will go into some more depth about some specific scams. So I just want to start by thanking APS for inviting us here today to talk about spotting scams and financial protection during the pandemic. We really appreciate the opportunity to get our information out to people like you who are on the front lines addressing elder abuse and elder financial exploitation, because it's great if we have this information, but it's even better if it's out there with the people who can use it and get it to people who are being harmed by scams. So thank you for your efforts and thanks for listening. And hopefully some of the resources we share today will help you in your work. Next slide, please. So, before we get started, I want to take a minute to tell you about the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. If you have not heard of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or CFPB, we are a U.S. government agency. We are a consumer protection agency like the FTC, but we're kind of the little sister to the FTC with the FTC being over 100 years old and the CFPB having been created about 10 years ago in the middle of the last housing crisis. So. Our goal at the CFPB is to work to make sure that banks and lenders treat everyone fairly. And in the Office for Older Americans, where I work, our, our office focuses on research policy and education to help protect older consumers from financial harm. And we also create tools and resources to help older consumers make sound financial decisions as they age. So we have a whole variety of resources you can use or view online, download or order in bulk all for free. And you can find those at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. And I'll be highlighting a few of them today. I also do need to give a disclaimer, much like the one that Andrew gave, which essentially sums up as saying, that anything I say is my opinion and not necessarily the opinion of the CFPB. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about COVID related scams. We know that the pandemic has changed all of our lives and that it has hit older adults particularly hard, both health wise and financially. Across all age groups, there's been a big increase in scams during the pandemic, according to the FTC's Consumer Sentinel data. Consumers reported losing more than $3.3 billion to fraud in 2020, up from $1.8 billion in 2019. So that's almost doubling during the pandemic. And of course it makes sense because with social isolation and increased online activity during the pandemic, we're all more at risk for scams. So as scammers are ramping up their efforts, it's a good time for us to talk about how to recognize and avoid these scams, because studies show that if people can recognize specific scams and know what they are, then they're far less likely to lose money to them. So today we're gonna to talk about some specific scams so you can recognize them if you see them in your daily work with people. And so you can pass along these tips to the older adults and other people you meet in your work to help them try to avoid these scams. Next slide, please. So I'll start by telling you about a resource that we have, consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. This is where the CFPB has put together all of our COVID related resources. We have them available in English and in Spanish, as well as in a variety of other languages you'll see mentioned on this slide. Um, we also have MP3 audio files for people who may like audio read-alongs and short videos for people who prefer videos or also for people who may be lower literacy. So the site has information about scams that we're going to discuss today, like vaccine scams, government imposters, and more. And it also has financial protection issues, which I'm going to touch on a little bit, like what to do if you have trouble paying your mortgage or your rent, as well as tips on how to prioritize bills and tips about managing your credit and debt during the pandemic. It has lots of videos with advice about how to do all of these things as well, how to prioritize bills, handle credit, and manage your finances. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the scams. Um, first, I'm gonna focus on the healthcare-related scams with a COVID twist. 
earlier months again months ago we at cfpb and ftc were really focusing on what we call vaccine scams where people were promising early access to vaccines for a fee or if you gave personal information well now the vaccines are readily available that is not so much of a popular scam anymore but there still are other healthcare related scams and bridge is going to talk to you about some vaccine related ones in her portion of the presentation but here are a few others to keep in mind one is test kit offers now the fda has now authorized some home testing kits and i just read an article this morning saying that they may become more widely available this fall but there are scammers calling people posing as medicare representatives and they ask for social security numbers in order to send you what they say is going to be a free home test kit and that's a scam you should not have to give your social security number in order to get a free home test kit um, and people can check with their local department of health for legitimate testing centers or legitimate test kit resources there also are scam offers related to air filter systems where scammers claim that they are selling filters that will remove COVID-19 from the air in your home. Um, there's no scientific proof for these systems. So if you know of anyone who receives a phone call, email, text message, or letter with claims to sell one of these, that is a scam as well. Now, I want to talk a little bit of it about contact tracing scams. On the right, you'll see a Federal Trade Commission infographic that talks about contact tracing scams. And what happens here is that scammers are pretending to be contact tracers in order to get people's personal information. They'll say that you've been exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID and then ask either for your personal information or your money. So to spot a scam, it's important to keep in mind that real contact tracers will not ask for money. Real contract tracers will not ask for your social security number or your bank account or your credit card numbers. And they also won't ask for your immigration status. So those are some real easy ways to uh, spot those contact tracer scams. Now on the next slide, you'll see a different category of scams that we call government imposter scams, where the scammers pretend to be from a government agency and they've you know, pretended to be pretty much government, every government agency there is, they've spoofed almost. Um, so one big one is social security or Medicare. The scammers will say that they're from Social Security or Medicare and say that they're going to give you special offer, special access to testing or treatments, but those are scams. Social Security and Medicare are not offering special access to COVID tests or treatments. So please do spread the word that if someone's getting a call like that to just hang up, don't give their Social Security number or a Medicare number to someone who calls out of the blue asking for that information for COVID related uh, tests or treatments. Another big one, which Bridget's going to talk about in more detail, are these FEMA scams that have to do with COVID related funeral expenses. So scammers are now pretending to be FEMA or the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And there is a legitimate program for up to $9,000 in funeral expenses um, for COVID related deaths. But unfortunately, scammers are stooping to a new low right now by preying on this and they're calling pretending to be from FEMA to get people's personal information. So there also are scams related to IRS impersonators and those economic impact payments and even COVID related unemployment insurance where people pretend to be uh, expediting your EIP payment or expediting your unemployment insurance. And in a new twist that particularly affects older adults they may try to make older adults what's called a money mule. So essentially they'll take these stolen unemployment benefits, the COVID related unemployment benefits that they've stolen from someone else. And then they'll come up with a scam, like a romance scam for an older adult. And they'll say, I'm sending you $10,000, send $8,000 here. So basically they're having the older adult launder money and be a money mule to launder the stolen unemployment funds. And they can do it through roommate scams, lottery scams, a whole variety of iterations of money mules. So that's something to keep an eye out for. That's a little more sophisticated and involved. Um, but we do have here at the bottom of this slide some tips on how to avoid government imposter scams and 
They are first to keep in mind that the government will not call about expediting your EIP. That's a scam. And also if you or someone else you know or an older adult who you go to visit in their home um, because they are being abused or suspected of being abused, that's a good time to check if they're also, you know, being caught up in financial exploitation or scams. So you can remind them that if they need to go to a government website, they should visit it directly by typing the name into the browser rather than clicking on links and texts or emails because those links can download malware that can take personal information off their computer. Uh, finally, remember the government will not ask for cash, gift cards, wire transfers, or cryptocurrency. The government doesn't take money that way. So if someone calls claiming to be from the government and asking for payment in one of those ways, that's a scam. Now let's talk about errand helper scams. Um, this one was really a big problem during the height of the pandemic when everyone was quarantined and locked in their homes. Um, and a lot of older adults may have been trying to find someone to do groceries or errands for them. Uh, now we want to keep an eye on this one, even though things have gotten better generally because with the Delta variant and everything and with winter coming, um, you know, there may be people looking to get help with errands again, or maybe they need them not for COVID reasons, but for other health reasons. So basically what happens in these scams is someone says they're going to help you with the errand and then they take your money and run away and don't do the errand. So for older adults, we recommend trying to find a trusted friend or neighbor. And if you order online using a trusted seller, and if you're a caregiver or, um, you know, somebody who's checking in on someone, check in by phone or video chat if you can't be there in person and ask questions. Um, also a great resource that probably all of you know about, but a lot of people we give these presentations to don't necessarily know about is the Elder Care Locator, which you can find at eldercare.acl.gov or 1-800-677-1116. That can help people um, find trusted help in their community. Now, on the next slide, I want to tell you about a different kind of scam that we call a coronavirus charity scam. Um, this is a twist on the charity scams that we see, you know, all times a year, but especially at the holidays when people are often feeling more generous and doing a lot of their charitable giving. Uh, now people are pretending to be coronavirus or COVID related uh, charities, and they are setting up fake looking, uh, well, they look real, but they actually are fake charities. And so to avoid accidentally giving money to a fake charity, this slide has some tips, which are never pay by cash, gift card, or money transfer. And to, again, to visit the organization's website directly, um, just like on the other slide, it's important to type in the URLs directly rather than clicking on links in unsolicited emails or pop-ups because those links can download malware or viruses on your computer. And also be wary of charities calling you for donations. Um, this is, of course, a legitimate way for legitimate charities to work. But if you get a call for someone asking for money, you should be able to say, I want something in writing before giving to the charity. And any legitimate charity will give you something in writing first. And if they don't, that's a pretty good red flag that it's not a legitimate charity. Another good way to check out charities is with the BBB, Better Business Bureaus, Wise Giving Alliance, and you can go to give.org to check out whether a charity is real or not and how the BBB rates them. On the next slide, I want to talk to you a bit about mortgage relief scams. Uh, if you know someone who's having trouble paying their mortgage or rent during the pandemic, or maybe you are having trouble, you're not alone. Um, some studies suggest that 20% of Americans are behind on the rent or mortgage payments right now. So the CFPB has set up a special site, consumerfinance.gov slash housing, where you can get information about mortgage payment options and how to avoid mortgage relief scams. The most important thing to remember in terms of avoiding mortgage relief scams is never pay upfront to someone who says they can stop a foreclosure. That's illegal for them to charge you upfront. So that's a sure sign of a scam. Also, some other red flags that can help you spot and avoid mortgage relief scams are if the company guarantees it'll get the terms of your mortgage changed, 
if they guarantee you won't lose your home. A big red flag is if you're instructed to send your payment to someone other than your mortgage company or servicer. Um, especially a lot of them will say, send your mortgage payment to me and I'll pay the mortgage company. Um, or if you're told to stop paying your mortgage, those are all red flags. And remember, if you are behind on your mortgage or your rent, you can find free help from HUD certified counselors. And I also, in a few slides, I'm gonna tell you about some special COVID related uh, housing help that's available as well. But first let's wrap up this scam portion of the presentation. And um, I have on here some basically bottom lines on how to recognize and avoid scams. So some defenses to scams are to just say no if anyone contacts you for your social security number, bank account number, Medicare number, any personal information over the phone out of the blue, you don't know who it is calling you. Even if the phone says social security or Medicare, they're able to, and they do spoof government numbers. They spoof other numbers as well. Sometimes they'll spoof a number from your own area code to look like they're your neighbor or someone you know. So you can't trust caller ID. You only really know who you're talking to if you hang up and call back at a number that you know to be correct. Another important tip for all types of scams, which I've mentioned a couple of times, but bears mentioning again, is don't click on links in unsolicited texts or emails because scammers use those to download malware, which can take your personal information. Also think about the way you're being asked to pay. If you're being asked to pay by gift card or wire transfer, don't do it. You're not gonna get your money back if it's a scam. Um, you also may wanna be leery about payments through peer-to-peer -peer payment apps um, if you're not sure who you are paying and it's not someone you've ever met or known before. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about pandemic financial protection and housing instability because a good way to you know, try to avoid scams also is to be in a good economic state where you're not worried about paying your rent or your mortgage or you're not as susceptible to say a lottery scam or a sweepstakes scam or a work at home scam where you think you'll get quick and easy money. So I want to tell about some resources for people who are facing housing insecurity right now because we know that's a lot of people right now and there is legitimate help out there. So on the next slide you'll see a picture of what's going on in terms of housing insecurity right now in our country. There are 6.7 million renter households behind on their rent as of May of 2021. That's based on a Moody's estimate. And as legal protections are starting to expire, some already have, some more will, over 8 million families are at risk of eviction and foreclosure. And we know that Black and Hispanic families are more than twice as likely to report being behind on their housing payments than white families. Now on the next slide, you'll see the resource that I mentioned earlier, consumerfinance.gov slash housing to help people who are struggling with paying their mortgages or rent. The CFPB launched this interagency housing website with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Federal Home Finance Agency. The website is a one-stop shop for consumers where you find accurate information about housing relief options available during the pandemic. So the interagency housing portal has resources to help you understand protections and actions you can take to get help. It has help for landlords too, if you're a landlord and not getting rent that can also have financial implications. So there's help for you on this site as well. Uh, it has information from CFPB, HUD, VA and more. And there are a lot of videos, plain language explanations, and links to relevant resources. I'll tell you a little bit about it. It goes over some mortgage payment options, and this is key given how many people are behind on their mortgages right now. You'll see this on the next slide. And perhaps, you know, if you're doing a home visit, you may find out that the person who you are, you know, talking to about suspected elder financial exploitation or elder abuse is also in a situation where they're behind on their mortgage. So please do refer them to consumerfinance.gov slash housing for more information. There are a few different things that may be of help to them or to you if you're behind on your mortgage. The first is what's called a forbearance. Um, and most 
homeowners can temporarily, temporarily pause their mortgage payments if they're affected by the pandemic. Most lenders are allowing that right now. There also are other foreclosure protections. The CFPB just issued a final rule which establishes safeguards to help make sure that borr borrowers can have a meaningful opportunity to be reviewed by loss mitigation before the servicer can make the first notice or filing required for foreclosure on certain mortgages. So if you're not familiar with the process, um, if you get a foreclosure notice, then often the first step is to talk to the servicers or the lenders loss mitigation department and try to talk to them about forbearance or uh, stopping the foreclosure. So, but we know during the last housing crisis when the CFPB was created, there were a lot of issues with the loss mitigation departments not necessarily acting in good faith. So this new rule is designed to make sure that the loss mitigation departments of loan companies actually talk to people and work with them. So there are additional protections effective until the end of 2021. There's also a homeowner assistant fund. Uh, the Congress has authorized nearly $10 billion for assistance with mortgage payments, homeowners insurance, utility payments, and other purposes. And as of May, 742 million had been given out with the remaining funds targeted to be given out by the end of the year. So that means there's still a lot of money out there to be given out to people who need it. On the next slide, you'll see about some of our help for renters. I was talking about people who may be behind on their mortgage, but there are a lot of people behind on their rent too. And to help those people, the CFPB recently launched a new rental assistance finder, which helps people locate and contact organizations that can give them money for COVID-related rent shortfalls, for past due utility bills, and for moving expenses too. So what you can do is you can go on this rental assistance finder, which again, you can find at consumerfinance.gov slash housing, and you can select your state, and then you'll see a list of the state and local emergency rental assistance programs. And it also has the websites and phone numbers, so it makes it very easy for people. Um, so again, I'm mentioning this in the context of pandemic scams, because people who have legitimate ways to pay their rent and mortgages hopefully will be a little less susceptible to mortgage relief or rental assistance scams. On the next slide, you'll see that we have some videos about these concepts because they aren't that easy. Um, so you can direct people to these videos either on YouTube or on the consumerfinance.gov slash housing site. The videos explain some of the COVID hardship housing protections they talk about how to enter and exit forbearance, prevent eviction, and other protections. There's one called Three Steps for Struggling Renters to Delay Eviction, and another one that's Five Steps to Ask for Mortgage Forbearance. And they're available in Spanish as well. So before I turn it over to Bridget to talk about uh, a little more in depth about some additional scams, I want to tell you about some resources that the CFPB has that hopefully will help you and the people that you serve. So on the next slide, you'll see our Money Smart for Older Adults campaign. This is an awareness program that the CFPB developed with the FDIC, and it helps people identify scams, fraud, and other exploitation. And we actually just recently released, released a COVID scam supplement to Money Smart for Older Adults. So you can find that online at consumerfinance.gov as well, which focuses on some of the COVID scams we discussed today. And the main Money Smart for Older Adults was created before COVID and covers a lot of scams that still continue on during the pandemic. Um, issues like identity theft, romance scams, lottery scams. It's designed as a train the trainer program. So if any of you give presentations in your communities, there's an instructor guide, which gives you a PowerPoint and then there's also a resource guide that's designed to hand out to older adults and their caregivers. It's very readable and 14 point font for older adults. So if you wanna give a scam presentation in your local community, you can use Money Smart and it'll give you the PowerPoint and guide you through the process. The resource guide has information and activities, a glossary of terms, and it can just be a standalone handout. And then the instructor guide has, like I said, the PowerPoint, it also has activities you can do, it has a summary and post-tests and evaluation forms. 
So those are all available for free in bulk for you to order at consumerfinance.gov slash order. On the next slide, we have another great resource called our fraud prevention placemats, or now we've actually expanded them so they're more than just placemats, so they are our fraud prevention resources more broadly. They were originally designed to be used by meal delivery programs like Meals on Wheels, and now we found that they're being used by community groups or other individuals and organizations in a variety of ways. Originally, they were just a nice paper placemat that could go under a meal that was delivered to an older person's home, and it had a fraud prevention message there. But we found that a lot of people were using them for posters and other fraud prevention awareness. And some of these placemats also have crossword puzzles and word games. And now we have companion resources and things like bookmarks and table tents. And again, you can order these all in bulk for free in English and Spanish to hand out in your community. On the next slide, you'll see our managing someone else's money guides. Um, these are great tools to help family members and friends who are financial caregivers. They're available at consumerfinance.gov slash MSEM, like managing someone else's money. Um, so this is really good um, if you go in as an APS person and see that maybe someone you think maybe someone's abusing their power of attorney or their guardianship. Um, these guides are helpful caregiver guides. They're designed for lay people to help them understand their duties. And they provide tips and resources to help fiduciaries understand what they're supposed to doing, be doing if they are acting as power of attorney. They have information on identifying benefits the care recipient can be eligible for. And they also describe warning signs of financial exploitation. You'll see here we have ones for four different types of financial caregivers, agents under power of attorney, guardians or conservators, trustees, and then government fiduciaries. On the next slide, you'll see a brand new publication that we call Considering a Financial Caregiver, Know Your Options. This is a good one. If you know someone kind of early in the caregiving cycle and you can see that maybe they might need help with managing their finances or maybe if you just want to plan ahead for your own financial future this lays out options for what can work best for the situation when the person is no longer able to manage their own finances it has informal caregiving options like convenience accounts trusted contacts and then the more formal caregiving options like power of attorney guardianship so again you can check this out and order copies at consumerfinance.gov slash MSEM. So if you're investigating a home where it seems like an older person may need help choosing an appropriate caregiver, this might be a good resource to offer them. On the next slide, you'll see a publication called Planning for Diminished Capacity and Illness. Uh, this is one that we've worked on with the SEC or Securities and Exchange Commission. And it's again about planning for future when you might not be able to manage your money or property on your own. This is an essential point of watching out for financial exploitation and avoiding scams. So we would encourage you to check this out and order it as well to hand out in your communities. On the next slide, you'll see information about if you need more help, you can find a lot of what I discussed today, consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus, including that housing page. And if you or someone who you meet in the course of your work needs to submit a complaint online to the CFPB, they can do it at consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. We do encourage people if they have a problem with a financial product or service to try reaching out to the company first because companies can usually answer questions unique to your situation and more specific to products or services they offer. Uh, but we do help consumers connect with financial companies to understand issues, fix errors, and get direct responses. So when someone submits a complaint to the CFPB, we work to get a response from the company, and most companies respond within 15 days. So again, you can go to consumerfinance.gov slash complaint to start the process. Um, and this is more for financial-related complaints, problems with banks, lenders, mortgage companies, credit card companies, credit reporting agencies. Bridget will tell you more about ways to report scams to the FTC. Um, but if you have a financial product or service that you want to file a complaint about, consumerfinance.gov slash 
complaint is the way to do so. So I'll be back to answer questions at the end, but I hope the tips that I've shared will help you and the people you know avoid scams and protect your finances during the pandemic. And with that, I will hand it over to Bridget. Okay. Um, hello, this is Bridget Small. I'm with the Federal Trade Commission, which is an independent federal agency that works to protect consumers. I'm in the Bureau of Consumer Protection which brings civil law enforcement actions against scammers. We do a tremendous amount of education to help people identify and avoid scams and bad business practices and ask people to report problems to us so we can be more effective in stopping problems. Um, we litigate cases against deceptive advertising, um, bad financial practices, deceptive marketing practices, and things related to that. And like Lisa, because I'm a federal employee, I need to make a disclaimer and say that while I work for the FTC, I do not speak for the Federal Trade Commission or any individual commissioner. My comments today are my own. So next slide, please. And I will talk about some individual scams. Um, Lisa has talked about some. I have a few more to talk about. But it's also important to talk about some things that all scams have in common so we can really think about avoiding scams. And, and so that you can help people avoid scams. And I also forgot my thank yous. So let me back up for a second and say thank you to the APS TARC. And thank you to all of you for being here to listen and learn um, and hopefully take back some ideas um, to share with the people that you work with. And some of that is avoiding scams. So scammers are trying to hustle people. They want to get them off balance. So when scammers reach out to people, they want to confuse them. They try to confuse them with fear. You know, the hurry up, send money now. Your social security number is about to be canceled. And those messages that um, generate fear and change the way someone can think or make them not able to think, or they use excitement like, you know, congratulations, this is your lucky day. Quick, tell me your bank account number, and I'm going to deposit that enormous check that you have just won, which is another way of getting someone to not be able to think. And scammers are pretty simple. You know, in the end, they want money or they want your personal information that they can use to get your money. So when you hear someone talk to you about something that has happened, if they just got a call or a text or some kind of communication, that has them in a state of agitation. They're very excited or they're very afraid. That's a clue to you that they may have been contacted by a scammer. And the story can change what the person has said, what the person has threatened, what the person has told them. But that state of agitation that the person is in is a, a sign that something bad has happened. You know, a scammer may have contacted them. And the fundamental things that we can remember and, and tell victims and potential victims is, if you get a call, an email, a text, and it has that shocking, scary tone to it, is just stop, talk to someone, talk about what the caller said. You don't have to jump up and respond. Put a little distance between what that person has done to you and what you do in response. And second, don't send money in any unsafe ways. Only a scammer is gonna demand that you instantly Send a wire transfer, a gift card, a prepaid debit card, or cash. Those kind of transactions can't be reversed, and that's exactly why they want it, because it doesn't leave a trail, and you can't undo it, or can't undo it there without a great deal of difficulty. And third, when you, in your professional capacity, have talked to someone and you've helped them resolve one of these problems, ask, give them a chance to be a hero. Ask them to pass on what they've learned and say, okay, good for you, great, you figured this out, please tell someone else in your circle what has happened and give them a chance to be a hero and spread the news because now that they know there's bound to be someone else who doesn't know and they can help. Next slide, please. Okay. Some of the pandemic scams that we've seen that use these kind of tactics, the fake uh, COVID-19 treatments and cures. Uh, FTC has seen 
a bunch of advertising for, you know, cures and treatments. People who claim their products are going to protect or heal. The companies advertise online, on social media, on YouTube. But they're advertising those things without having the scientific evidence they need to back up the claim. They advertise things. And these are a real um, thing. I'm not saying the, the items are real, but these are things that we have seen advertised. Intravenous vitamin therapy, peptide therapy, probiotic treatments, a bacteria killing card that you wear somewhere near your face, electric current devices that will selectively electrocute microorganisms, nasal sprays, and other kinds of supplements. When the FTC has observed these things and found them out in the marketplace, they sent uh, warning letters telling the companies they should cease and desist making those claims, which are potentially you know, false and deceptive advertising. And for the most part, those companies have stopped. Another scam has been the vaccine lottery, where someone will get an email or a text saying, please complete this limited time survey about the vaccine and um, you're going to get a prize, but you do need to pay shipping and handling fees. And of course, that's a scam. You know, if you want to participate in a survey, you don't have to give your credit card or bank account number. And as Lisa said, if you get something like that, don't click on any links. You may end up downloading malware that's going to steal your information or put a virus on your device. It's just something you don't need. Uh, that thing is still circulating. Last week, we got a, a notice from someone who'd gotten a text about the Joe Biden COVID-19 Relief Fund. So the versions will continue. Um, and in, go, in most cases, they're looking for, again, money or personal information. There are also scams related to fake COVID-19 vaccine cards. Uh, you know, buying a card, making your own card, or filling in a blank card with false information is illegal. Now, people can be fined or even land in jail. And giving someone personal information so they can give you a fake card can end up in identity theft because they can misuse your personal information. And right now, there are no plans to create a national vaccine app, certificate, or passport. But if people see something online, they may be misled, and it may look like a government site, but it's probably just another invitation to identity theft, to scoop up people's information. Next slide, please. The pandemic uh, help with funeral uh, costs is something that Lisa already mentioned. This is legitimate help available through FEMA, and you can't apply online. Um, if anyone gets a call from someone pretending to be from FEMA, and they haven't contacted FEMA first, that's a scam. You may already know about this through your, through your work. Um, if not, you'll have the slide, and now you know. Um, but this is something that, this is a very common trend among scammers. Anytime a new benefit comes out, you can expect that a scammer will pivot and try and use it to his or her advantage and, um, you know, contact people and say, hey, I'm here to offer you the benefit. Uh, that is not the case with a FEMA funeral assistance. Next slide, please. Pass it on information is something that the FTC created for older adults. It's a set of information on 13 topics, and these are a set of fact sheets and bookmarks. You can see a small image there on the screen on 13 topics. And the fact sheets have just the essential text. Each one explains a scam and what to do if you spot it. You can order all this information in print, in bulk, it's in English and Spanish, and you can have this delivered. This might make life a little easier for you if you have something on hand to distribute or leave behind or put in a place where you know people are going to visit. It's available, um, as I said, on 13 topics. Some of the top, some of the things that people are ordering right now are related to unwanted calls, identity theft, romance scams. Uh, the money mule scams, as Lisa mentioned, where a scammer will unwittingly use someone to transfer money between bank accounts for him. It also covers IRS imposters, home repair scams, um, and other things to add up to 13 total topics. Next slide, please. This is a really important thing for us, is getting people to report fraud and report identity theft and get help. 
The reportfraud.ftc.gov that you see on the left has a sister site in Spanish, which is accessible from the English side. Even if you don't lose money, it's important to let us know what's going on. And we really rely on community reports to build investigations. And we really want to know what's going on in every community. And when you report, and you can report for yourself, you can help someone report, and please encourage the people you talk to to report. We use that information to build investigations and law enforcement nationwide shares the database. And they can put together pieces of information from different locations to help build cases and find trends and identify scams that may be emerging in different places all at once and track down what's going on. And when a person reports, they will get, after they submit the report, they'll get a list of steps that they can take or some information they can use, excuse me, that will help them address the problem they've reported. Identitytheft.gov is a one-stop place where a person can report identity theft. And that's where someone can report someone using their current accounts, opening new accounts, using their information. Um, and the more information a person puts in there, um, the more detailed a recovery plan they'll get. That's what I was saying about the detailed steps. If a person puts in sufficient advice, they're going to get an identity theft report. And that report gives them certain rights to have um, records corrected, like getting information removed from a credit report that isn't related to them, and contacting businesses to get things corrected. And that site has sample letters that a person can use to send to credit bureaus and businesses where the information is misused. The identity theft.gov also has a companion site in Spanish. And in most sites, when you report to identity theft.gov, that takes the place of a police report, which can save people a lot of time and work. And the next slide, please. Okay. This is the slide um, which tells you a bunch of resources from the FTC all in one place. The first line is how you can subscribe to get our regular um, scam alerts, which come out as short blog posts uh, a couple times a week. The second line is where we have the directory of all our COVID um, coronavirus information. Go to that page and you can then jump to the articles, the blogs, all the other information in English and Spanish. Then there's our landing page for all our consumer information. And then the place to go to order all the free print material. And it's not just on scams. There's stuff on debt and credit, your funeral rights, um, your shopping, auto buying, a variety of things. I encourage you to go there for a couple of minutes, browse around, see what interests you. And then the last two are things I just mentioned, report fraud and identitytheft.gov. And that's it for me. I want to thank you for your time and please encourage you to use what we've got. It's free. Um, and if it can help make life easier for you, I hope you will use it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget and Lisa. This was an amazing amount of information um, and it's all extremely helpful stuff. I have to say I'm pretty impressed at everything, all the resources that your two different agencies have amassed. Um, so um, now that both of our speakers have concluded, now is a good time to ask your questions. Go ahead and type them in via the questions box and I will relay them to our speakers. So while people are getting their questions in order, we already have a few that have popped up. So. I will read these out and repeat them if necessary. Um, can the presenters please say something about the kickoff of the five regional virtual uh, retreats for the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Networks and the two national retreats? Again, the five regional virtual retreats for the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Networks and the two national retreats, if either of you are familiar with those. So this is Lisa, the CFPB. I, I can tell you a little bit about the CFPB's Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Networks. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to or not, but my colleague Jennifer Duane is in charge of that program. And basically, um, she just had a convening last week in South Carolina, and I know she's had convenings in Hawaii, Texas, and I believe two other places. And so basically what she's trying to do with these elder fraud prevention and response networks is 
get together a group of people on the ground, kind of like a multidisciplinary team, who are working to prevent elder fraud and exploitation in the community. It can be people from APS, it can be people from legal services, it can be people from the attorney general's office, medical professionals, a whole variety of people working on elder fraud prevention and response. And so that people get to know each other in their community and can work together better. Um, so we have a whole elder fraud prevention and response network guide now, which you can find on our website at consumerfinance.gov. And if you have any questions, I would encourage you to uh, email us at olderamericans at consumerfinance.gov and we can connect you with Jennifer who can give you a lot more details. Great, thank you, Lisa. And just as a reminder to everybody participating today, the handouts um, you know, have the slides for today and all of the websites that were mentioned. So feel free to download those. We'll also post them with the recording and um, make sure that you're made aware when the recording is posted. Um, our next question, are we permitted to share the resources shared today um, on our social media sites? Again, the information yeah. that you've shared today, can we share it on social media? Please do. This is Bridget yes. for the FTC. Absolutely, that would be wonderful. Please do. Agreed. This is federal government information. We would be thrilled if you would um, share it and distribute it and use it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question, uh, the person says, sorry if I missed it, but what is the benefit of a client using identitytheft.gov versus reportfraud.gov since both are at the FTC? Identitytheft.gov is specifically for uh, situations of identity theft. And if that's what the person has experienced, that's where they should report because they'll get assistance specific to that problem. Great. Um, our next question, we always advise people to do a police report, but is it more appropriate to only report to the FTC or should we do both? A police report, if a person has experienced identity theft, if that's what we're talking about, and they have had like an experience like, you know, a home break in where a police report is necessary, then, you know, of course that's necessary. But if the person has experienced like you know, for example, uh, a report with their tax, a problem, excuse me, with their tax returns, um, and they need to convey that information to the IRS, they're going to have a lot better luck going through identitytheft.gov because we are working in cooperation with the IRS. And when they indicate they've had tax identity theft, the information will be transmitted directly to the IRS. That's not going to happen with a police report. They go through identitytheft.gov, they create the FTC identity theft affidavit, and they indicate it was tax identity theft. They will they will transmit the information directly, you know, and they will have the paperwork done that they need. Is that a police all? report may, Sorry, may be ahead. necessary in some circumstances, but not in all circumstances. What and about with free to, Oh, sorry. Okay. I mean, let me do this before I lose, eat up all your time. Be, be small at ftc.gov. Person can reach me there. And what about scams? Would you say the same thing, Bridget, if someone's been a victim of one of the scams you mentioned today that you, Lisa, mentioned? Should they also file a police report? Um, again, you know, it really depends on the situation. If someone has experienced something that is sufficient to, you know, to merit a police report, if, then of course they should use their judgment and file a police report. Reporting to the FTC is not is reporting to report fraud is providing information to law enforcement about a scam. It does not get a, an individualized response, like if you've had a, you know, a car break in or a home break in or some, or you know, uh, some other personal crime. It's providing information to law enforcement, but it doesn't get a call back or a, a police officer coming to your home. It's not like that. Yeah. It's providing information to help people build investigations on a nationwide scale. But if you feel that you've been a victim of a crime that needs to be reported to the police, then, then that's the thing to do, certainly. Excellent. Um, our next question, the Department of Justice started the Elder Fraud Hotline. Um, this person says it's 833-FRAUD-11. 
do you have any experience working with their hotline or cases that come from it? Um, any familiarity with that hotline? I don't have any direct experience with it, but um, have worked with some of the counselors who work on the hotline and they seem to be uh, very knowledgeable and empathetic. So I would think it would be a good place to call and Department of Justice, of course, is a, a leader on these issues. So True. I would definitely look to them as a place to call and as a good resource. Great. Um, our next question, what is the best way to assist a client who is the victim of a romance scam? What would either of your recommendations be on that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a really hard one because romance scams, people don't want to be told that it's a scam and they don't want to believe you even when they are told. Um, I think it kind of often takes a multi-pronged attack to get people to believe that it is a romance scam. So maybe involving any friends or family members to try to talk to them too. And also, I mean, you can hand them things like the FTC's Pass It On has a romance scam Ooh. sheet and uh, Money Smart for Older Adults from the CFPB has a romance scam sheet. And uh, so you could order those for free and give them to the person and just say, hey, look, this this is happening to a lot of people. Yeah maybe you'll recognize it as perhaps what is happening to you. And, you know, <laughs> describe to them some of the things that indicate it's a scam, like the person says they're overseas often and they can't get to you and they want you to wire money or put it on a gift card, those types of things. I think too, if the, if the you know, if the scammer is saying anything that involves being a member of the military, or um, like member of reported of known institutions, things like member of the military or being the FBI, a lot of those agencies have posted things online saying scammers are misusing our name. Like the army has stuff posted online saying mm. our soldiers don't need your money and things like that. Um, so, or, you know, the UN, no, our, our, we don't have surgeons in Yemen that need your money, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I'm also, you know, the, there's ahead. a question of financial financial autonomy because, you know, you know, bottom line is this person putting herself into financial distress. Um, there's there's that question too. Yeah. You know, do you want her to be out of the romance scam or does she want to be out of the romance scam? There's there's just a lot. There's that's just a thorny thorny thing. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So, but but there are a lot of you know, all the resources that Lisa mentioned. And there are also, um, as I said, the other outside institutions that are trying to just cut through and say, we are not involved in this. These people are misusing our name. Mm -hmm. And to remind and some older adults too, do not want to be involved in financial fraud. And if they realize that, hey, if you use this person's financial information, you could be complicit in a crime, yeah. that may stop someone. Well, and as we close in on the top of the hour, um, this is a big question, but we'll make this our last one. Will scams ever end? Why can't something be done to stop them? So I guess this question is more about prevention of scams. Any efforts that either of you are aware of? Sure. Well, the FTC and CFPB both regularly bring law enforcement actions to try to shut down scams and take away assets from scammers. Um, but of course, scammers are good and they do try to morph and create a new scam as soon as one is shut down. So government agencies are working on it, um, yep. but the person is recognizing a trend that scams do evolve. Well, and all these... And that's why we're... Oh, go ahead, Bridget. We're glad to talk to you. All. That's why we're so glad to talk to you all because, you know, we need to spread the word. We, we don't know if they'll end, but we know we can keep fighting. Well, and I was going to say, with all these brilliant public awareness materials that you guys have told us about today, um, we're certainly well on our way, I think. So, all right. Well, it looks like we're um, just at the top of the hour. I would like to thank Lisa and Bridget so much for coming and presenting all this information today. If we can go to the last slide real quick, um, there'll be some contact information for the APS TARC. Here is our website, and there is our email address if you would like to reach out to us. Um, if you're an Adult Protective Services program and you'd like assistance, 
by all means, reach out to us and we will do anything we can to help you. Again, thanks to Lisa and Bridget for coming today and providing all this great information. Thanks to all of our attendees today, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Take care, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you.